Head to Subway for the tangy new Tuscan Chicken Melt, seasoned chicken melted cheese and olive vinaigrette. With 9 grams of fat, it's part of a Subway fresh fit meal. A simpler way to enjoy eating better. Hurry in today. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. Now, now, now. Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. We had a momentous pop culture moment this past Thursday. Michael Jackson, the king of pop, passed away. And uh, we had to have our friend Chuck Klosterman, one of the premier, if not the premier, pop culture expert, to come on and talk about that and some other stuff. We went so long that we had to spread this into two parts. My apologies. Here's part one. Chuck Klosterman on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. What's happening? Everything. Uh, have you digested the death of the King of Pop? I guess I have. I was uh, I was on I was in Milwaukee when it happened, and uh, a guy just told me Michael Jackson died, and then I had the audacity to call someone in New York to find out he'd been dead for like, or the announcement had been 20 minutes ago, and they were shocked I didn't know. I guess people just assume everyone's supposed to know everything simultaneously, but uh, yeah. So I mean. I mean, it's, it was definitely shocking, of course. I mean, I don't know if that's surprising, but, you know. I wasn't shocked. It was one of those things that uh, I heard the news. I was like, yeah, this makes sense. So, you know, when it was being rushed to the hospital, it seemed, you know, he'd, he'd been weird. He'd been kind of in seclusion the last 10 years. It seemed like he never seemed to me a guy who was going to grow old. Well, he was a prime candidate to die, certainly. Yeah. You know? But it's still, of course, kind of jarring. Yeah. Um, I have actually been sort of... More interested by, I don't know, by the response to his death. I guess in some ways it's kind of predictable, um, but it is. It just drives me crazy whenever the situation happens. Yeah, that's well. That's one of the reasons I want to have you on is because I have to say I did not anticipate the response. I didn't anticipate that it would people would be this affected, and especially in the African American community, um, much, much, much bigger. Than I thought it would be in terms of he's the king, we'll miss you, and it's like the last twelve years have been swept under the rug, basically. Well, where have all these years. people been for twenty five years? Yeah, he's been an object of ridicule almost nonstop for two decades. Okay, so over this entire period, um, pretty much if Michael Jackson came up in conversation, it was either like kind of a straw man for weirdness, or it was just some kind of criticism of him in general. And yeah. now, after he dies, I understand people saying great things about him you know, after someone passes away. I mean, he, he was this sort of iconic, brilliant musician. But what I think is weird is all these people now creating this false narrative about their relationship to his music. How come mm. I, I, you go on Facebook now and you just see literally all these people talking about how, like, Thriller was the soundtrack to their life and they remember, you know, watching... You know, like the smooth criminal video and all these. How come no one had mentioned this for a decade? And now they, but like, it's almost as though they watch television and they see that this is sort of a big moment and they really want to feel as though that they were a part of that experience. I just think it's so curious to see people try to reinvent their relationship to somebody once that person dies. Yeah, from from my standpoint, he was certainly one of the defining musicians of my childhood. I wouldn't put him at the top. I'd put him, you know, I I, I definitely mark I, when I think back to like maybe 1979 to 1985 or 1986. I remember different moments in my life that he may have been involved with. But I could also say that about Kurt Cobain, Tupac, like you know, a million different musicians. Um, yeah, you're I, picking all the dead ones. What well, about the people? You know, how come people aren't saying? You know how important Boy George is now, and how Boy George sort of represented, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, this move toward uh, uh, really kind of accepting uh, gay people in public and sort of living a transgressive lifestyle, which is what they're going to say when Boy George dies. Okay, yeah. and they're going to say about he, watching the Karma Chameleon video, and they're going to have all these memories about it. But no one's saying that now. He's got to be dead first. I was watching this weekend, you know, all these specials, and you know, uh, probably okay. 
I would say maybe one of the best single performances I've ever seen was when Michael Jackson was at the Motown 25th anniversary special. Agreed. Everyone has said this, okay? Yeah. Everyone has mentioned this. But people are actually going too far with this. I saw one person was saying how for weeks after the 25th anniversary special, all people were talking about was this performance of Billie Jean. In a couple of weeks, people aren't going to be talking about the death of Michael Jackson. It was totally untrue that it was such a part of culture that you could not escape conversation about his performance at the Motown special. But people seem to want to remember this now. They want, they want to have been part of this, of this, of this person's life. I, I, just, I, I don't think it's, it seems really unreal to me. Yeah, I mean, for me, it certainly was an iconic TV moment for me, but I don't, I wouldn't put it any higher or lower than when Stevie Wonder and Eddie Murphy did the SNL skit where Eddie put on the glasses and did the Stevie impersonation right next to him or 20 other things that happened. I thought it was, you know, it was one of those seminal TV moments, but not, I don't remember talking well, it was, about it, it was, five it, it weeks was later. It was a great performance, you know, he yeah. was a, you know, he made some great songs, but I, you know, I, the other thing that, that I find really interesting about this reaction is there seems to be uh, this is more in the media. This sort of this this ongoing debate people are having, this internal monologue people are having. It's like, okay, so now that he's dead, how do we separate the music from his strangeness? You know, how um, you know what will ultimately be the legacy? Will it be you know Thriller and these records, or or will it sort of be his his personal life, his reclusive life? And to me, they seem completely connected. That that they, that they, it would be impossible to think of one without thinking of the other. Certainly, the greatness of his music, to a degree, was dependent on his astonishingly bizarre sort of worldview. I mean, I, I, I yeah. don't. It, it would be very odd to try to look at Thriller without thinking of the person who made it and the person he was going to become. You know, I, I, like on MTV, they were. Uh, they, I guess they were replaying when Sway was was like in the rainstorm talking to Sheryl Crow and various people about Yeah, I saw it. The best yeah. part was when he had Little Mama on the line, but she wasn't there. Little Mama! Little Mama! <laughs> he just kept saying it. It was great, but go ahead. But uh, he was talking to, to John North, and uh, John North was talking about how he really liked the song Black and White. He was saying how, you know, it's not one of people's favorite songs, but it is to him because it sort of exemplifies how Michael Jackson you know, transcended race. Yeah. He was a he was a kind of a musician for for white people and black people, but to me, when I look at that, when I listen to that song now, it seems almost completely literal. That I mean, this guy was trying to become someone who was neither black or white. He, I mean, it, like I think a lot of the songs now that that we're trying to sort of find sort of the subtext in that we should just be listening to the text. Um, the song "Bad" is like that too. Uh, he, in the course of bad, he's like, you know, the whole world has to, like, deduce if he's bad or not, you know, and he, and he uses the phrase, the whole world. He actually had a life that, for real, that if anybody else had, would be this insane paranoid delusion that the entire world is interested in your iconography. But he was obviously right. I mean, right. all the things about Michael Jackson where he was this, this insane egomaniac, or we, he, was, he probably underestimated... <laughs> how big he was in a way or, or or he estimated it correctly right and you know i always thought he got a little too much credit for his lyrics i thought his lyrics were actually pretty simple man in the mirror is probably the the best written song that he had and i didn't even think well, who was giving it. him credit for his lyrics well no i mean like you talk about the john norris black and white thing he's like whoa i always interpreted that i think michael jackson just i think the lyrics are pretty pretty simple to interpret like he wrote bad because he wanted people to think that he was still kind of a badass you know, well, the craziest lyrics are the one to that Earth song, where he at, where he actually has a line where he's like, "What about the elephants?" Oh yeah, he has well, the fear that the, you know, and then they show in the video like the elephant decomposing or whatever. You know? he, well, he also he'd create lyrics like Shamo, mm -hmm. he, that Shamo. Like we like, I remember my buddy Gus and I were trying to we we were like looking up in the dictionary what Shamo meant. It just turned out it was a word Jackson made up, like "Mama say, Mama sa, pusa." I think he's just like making stuff up. I don't think he, there was any sort of real genius. Well, he was I don't just a know. weird I guy mean, that made up words. I don't know words. if genius is the right word, but his, uh, his, 
certainly his experience is very specific to him. He has that song in that video, Leave Me Alone, okay? Where, and, and if you remember, you go on this, watch this video on YouTube or whatever, he goes and tries to debunk, debunk all the myths about him. Like he right. dances with the elephant man's bones and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, so what he's basically doing in this video is he is, a te- he is seemingly showing genuine outrage over being accused of stories that he generated himself. And that are probably true. Like he did attempt to bid on the elephant band's bones, you know? Yeah. And that story would not have gotten out unless he promoted his own weirdness. And then at some point he's acting as though this has been, that this has been like cast upon him. I just, I, I, I really do think he's probably lived the strangest life of any American. I can't, I can't think of even who would be next. Well, I wanted to piggyback on something you said earlier. You said it's tough for you to separate the strangeness from the music. I always assumed that when Michael Jackson died, the reaction would be, wow, what a tragedy. Like, that guy was the king of pop, one of the greatest musicians ever, and he just turned into a freaking weirdo and had this child molestation case that he had to settle out of court for $25 million. And I thought that was going to be his legacy. And instead, the the consensus seems to be, all right, well, we're going to give him a mulligan in the last 20 years. And uh, from, you know, up until about 87, amazing. What a musician. Let's remember that. I'm surprised that, you know, I'm kind of happy that it went that way, but at the same time, society doesn't usually work that way. We're not that forgiving, usually. Well, people will forgive things fast upon death, though. Uh, and it is a di- I mean, you know, you, when you go back and you see that footage of him in the Jackson 5 now, yeah, I feel like if, we, if there was a new artist that we saw who was that young, who seemed to be por- performing at such a high and clearly rehearsed level, I think that there would be sort of questions about it. People would all, you know, even when the person was, Seating, there'd be a certain contingency of people who'd be like, it's kind of weird that this person who's clearly so young is, is, is put in this position where he's fronting this band or whatever. Um, and like, yeah. that didn't happen in the 70s. So, you know, it, it also is interesting, though, that, that you talk about this Mulligan principle. It's, now you, there's a lot of people saying how because he never had a childhood, it, uh, it made sense that he spent his entire life trying to recruit you know recreate his childhood in a very overt way like even yeah. calling your ranch neverland which is like boys who don't grow up or whatever you know but at the same time it's like is that understandable i mean he's not the first person who was not able to have a childhood is it, is it was it really the normal extension of that i i don't know i don't think so if <laughs> that was my wife's argument because we're arguing about the whole little boy thing which fortunately now he's dead and there's no fear of libel suits but Let's be honest, like you're having sleepovers with boys. If you read all the Vanity Fair stuffs online, you can read any of the stories. Then he never sued them for libel over anything that was in there. And basically, this guy had sleepovers only with boys. And if they had a sister, the sister slept in another room. Jackson was with the little boys. And, you know, he had this elaborate alarm system in his bedroom where if somebody even came within 20 feet of his bedroom, you know, bells went off. And then if they're about to open the door, alarms went off. Like, what could be the possible explanation for this stuff? Well, you know, I guess the, the, if you're in his camp, it would be, well, you know, he also likes to sit in a tree for no reason. <laughs> that's a, I mean, you, know, when you start adding those elements in, when you yeah. start saying that his behavior is so bizarre that, like, anything is, you know, but, I mean, also I think people obviously don't want to think about that part of his life. No. Um, um, because then, you know, but... Well, it's a funny counter-argument, though, because people who will say, nah, that stuff wasn't true, that, those people used him for, you know, they, they, they kind of pulled one over on him for money. Okay, that's fine. Well, here's my counter for you. If you had a 12-year-old boy, would you have let him sleep over at the Neverland Ranch? Everyone's like, well, no, obviously not, but I still don't think he did it. Well, like, well why don't you want your son to sleep over at the Neverland Ranch? Then? I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 it's it's odd. I mean, he's an odd person, and and. Uh, what well, do it, you think? Underrated or overrated? Mm, or properly rated? Well, because Thriller guess, and know, Bad I mean, it, it, and Off the Wall, those are three Pantheon albums. Well, for pure performing ability, I mean, in terms of of you know, uh, performing on stage, basically being able to sort of visually capture people, I think he would be the top. You know, I, I can't I can't think of who I would say is a better on stage performer. I can't think of anyone. Okay. Well would you and, say maybe Elvis, but we weren't really alive to remember Elvis when he was good. 
that was that was more jarring to people, I think, just because. I mean, he also had the benefit of rock being this new thing. So Elvis yeah. was really sort of representing this whole kind of new kind of youth culture that was manifesting itself through music. Right. I mean, Michael Jackson is. Well, you know, it, I mean, sure, obviously everyone has seen these performances now. I feel like you can talk about them pretty specifically. The thing that, that was pretty amazing about him is when he would dance, he, was, uh, he really had the ability to inject a lot of drama into almost totally meaningless stage moves. Yeah. I mean, like when you see him move his head or like throw his shoulder in a direction or something, he, he, he was just like, he basically could make every single move he made seemingly kind of event-like. So it was. It is hard when you watch him perform not to sort of be shocked, regardless of how you feel about the music. I mean, the music is really good too. Uh, the bass line on Billie Jean is incredible. I mean, the fact that he had Eddie Van Halen play on Thriller uh, was kind of a meaningful event. Uh, yeah. Uh, that whole record is really just produced really well. I think if you take the part of the part of the song "Bad," where the backing vocals say like. Uh, really, really bad, you know, the high part. If you yeah. remove that, that song would seem much more competitive. That's the part that kind of dates it and makes it seem ridiculous. Yeah, I I just thought those three albums, you can't take it away from them, but really everything that happened after that, everything, was a little weird. The other part that's weird is that he kind of represents the nadir of decision-making for a couple different celebrities who are equal of his stature. Like, if you watch that Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson video now, it is astonishingly bad. Like, you can't believe that Jordan's people didn't talk about that. Same thing with the Eddie Murphy one that he did. And then uh, even the Paul McCartney Say, 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 Say. Mm -hmm. Remember how awkward that video was? It's, like, incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's videos were, well, there's a lot of videos that don't stand up, though. I mean, that was, uh, yeah, that was kind of a hard... Uh, <laughs> Beat you know, it. Beat uh, it, is, I think, is number one on the list. Yeah. Oh, you said, no, because I think that, that that video probably, to me, that's when I think of, if I was describing to say an alien what rock videos are, that's probably the example I would use. Oh, you think that holds up? Well, I mean, holds up, and what do you mean? I mean, when someone, if you're thinking about what the video medium is, wouldn't, pretty much almost every aspect of what rock videos are supposed to do encapsulated in that clip. I mean, it shows the artist, shows, it gives an aesthetic of what the artist is supposed to be like or what he's trying to represent himself as like. Um, it sort of as the visual aspect of the dancing, which was how pop videos in the 80s were. Uh, it, See, I, you know, there's a, there's an, it has elements of narrative without a real narrative. Yeah. I would go with Hungry Like the Wolf by Duran Duran. That would that, be to me is the, good icon, one, the, uh, the classic know. 80s video of like weird stuff happening that can't be explained, and there's a hot girl. Was there a hot girl on Beat It? I can't remember. Uh, there, I, I think Barely. in the opening when they're in a diner, there's a woman in there. But yeah, that was never a part of it, I guess. Well, I mean, they, Hungry Like the Wolf is a good example of elements of narrative. Yeah. Like, you know, there's characters, but there's, you know, there's not really a story. Um, there's conflict. But it's not really resolved. I mean, you know that. <laughs> yeah. That, that sort of. I think that's when you ever you look at videos from that period. That's the interesting thing because it was guys who couldn't make movies, generally directing these things, and they had these aspirations to show to like fit in aspects of cinema in these short clips. So they just kind of picked parts and then really develop them. Yeah. What would you say, in your opinion, the first really great music video? The first really I'm not, great. I'm not saying like succeeded, be, like Beat It did, that actually was, you know, was kind of dopey. But I'm saying like a video that you're like, wow, that was awesome. Well, um... Because I have two. It probably would be something that predates the term video. I mean, you know, like there's, there are, like Black Sabbath made short films from like some of the stuff on like Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Yeah, I mean those are pretty amazing to watch now. I, but I don't. But they they weren't thinking of them as videos. What are the two you're going to use? Uh, they're they're two very different videos. But one would be Cindy Lauper's Time After Time. Okay. Which was a story that was told from beginning to end. That's actually like pretty good, and you kind of want them to end up together at the end. Mm -hmm. It was well done. I remember watching that over and over again as a, as a kid and thinking like, this is just well done. This is a good story. And then the other one. Which still holds up, and I just watched on, on uh, not YouTube, but another one of those sites, Daily Motion, recently. Bronski beats Small Town Boy. Well, those are some interesting selections. I would Do you not remember that one? I'm, tr I'm trying to think. Actually, you know, I'll be honest, I don't. Jimmy Somerville riding a bus 
he's in some foreign country. I don't remember what country it was. Turns out he's being beaten up by his dad. He's having flashbacks to it. And, you know, the dad throws him out of the house and it just ends with him like riding on the bus, just sad, like his life hasn't worked out. It's really like, it's almost like the, the, you watch it, you think it like could have won an Oscar. So when you're saying a video holds up, what you're saying is that it seems like it could be made today. Yeah, like it's you watch it now and you don't think how corny it is or how nostalgic it is or how they should have done this or look how look look how eighties this looks. Well, but I feel like that's part of it though. I sort of like the fact that videos are periods like are like period pieces for that era. I think like when I, the, probably the video if I if you honestly like what like the first video that I really loved or still I really remember is the video of uh, of Jump from Van Halen. Yeah, that's and, a good one. And what, what what I like about it is that that really shows what the mentality of video creation was at the time, which is that this is a commercial for the album. Yeah. And that we're playing the song, and we're going to literally do what the song is, but we're literally going to jump. In slow know? motion. And in, it's, in the, it's the band performing in an empty studio, as if they're having a concert, but no one is there. But I think it really kind of shows what Van Halen was at that time, or what, or the way that Van Halen wanted to present itself. So I, 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 to me, that. So I don't. I, I think that videos are supposed to, do, to a degree, be dated, feel dated. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh. I was talking more about videos that I thought were amazing at the time that I can watch now and still think they're kind of amazing. And I can't believe I'm saying that about a Cindy Lauper video, but I, just I guess really maybe like you were very moved by it. I was. I was moved yeah. by Cindy. I was moved I, by her uh, her passion. The main thing I remember about the song "Time After Time" is. When I was between my freshman and sophomore year of high school, I went to the Future Farmer, uh, Future Farmers of America State Conference in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. And all the state Future Farmers of America officers would give their goodbye speeches, and one of the female, uh, like the state FFA secretary, sang the song time after time as her goodbye speech, like a cappella to the entire audience. That was. Oh my God pretty weird but it was it was very memorable it's the, it's the only thing i remember about that week when do you think videos started to change into where they eventually just stopped becoming as interesting and why um well i mean there's a lot of different arguments about this one you could you could some people would argue that videos started changing when they actually got quote unquote good when, it, when you could start, when the production value and the money behind them became really extreme, and mm. they sort of moved from being commercials for the record, which is what a music person often really wants to see, to this other thing that um, um, almost kind of detracted from the experience of listening to the song. Because Young directors trying to prove that they're really good directors and maybe get a job out of the video. Well, not even just, I mean, like, well, you could use Thriller as an example. It's very difficult to imagine the song Thriller in your mind without seeing the video itself. It actually would seem as though the song was conceived with that idea, um, which is interesting because that was probably impossible. MTV wasn't showing black artists at the time. Uh, so it's, it's crazy that Michael Jackson thought he should... Like, that his, obviously, the, re, the song on Thriller he liked the most was kind of Thriller, the one that he thought was most emblematic of it because he named the album after it. He didn't yeah. write that song. But he obviously saw it as something that was, was what he wanted to sort of demonstrate. And he, he, could, he could have never envisioned that video happening. Because at the time, he would have had to think, well, it doesn't matter how good these videos are. MTV is racist. They'll probably just never play a black artist. <laughs> well, I think the only one they were playing at that point was Rockwell. Right, it was later, you know. Oh, was that? What was that? Well, because like, right? Michael Jackson sings on, on that song. He's say, well, on, didn't Say, Say, Say come out before Thriller? Uh, I think it did. I think because Say 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 was the first. I, they were I, like do, not, I do not think because Say 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 was on McCartney's record. Yeah, um, it was before uh, Thriller. I though, don't I think. know. No, because well, any any video that you're seeing that you remember seeing Michael Jackson in is kind of post Thriller because Billy Jean was the first video MTV showed with a black artist. Yeah, that's true. So, and that, um, it's a surprisingly but no, underwhelming but video. Michael Jackson now. is on sings. That, I mean, that that showed how I guess how famous he was at the time. That the, that single by Rockwell was able to chart simply because he sang the chorus on it. Uh, I haven't heard Rockwell's. Res is Rockwell dead now? <laughs> I was going to say it's been one of the most unexplained questions of the last thirty years. Why Michael Jackson sang on that Rockwell song? Was was Rockwell the son of somebody? He must have been the son of somebody. Was he like uh, the son of Barry Gordy or something? I have no. I, you know that that doesn't sound wrong, but I don't think it's right either. I'm not sure. Joe uh, Mead, we looked that up. Uh, 
Will you look out who Rockwell was the son of? I bet he was the son of somebody, because that, that was just too strange. But, you know, uh, uh, we talked a lot about Michael Jackson. There is something I want to talk to you about today, though. I, 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 I feel it's almost my obligation as a journalist to talk about this. Oh, uh, Twitter? What? Twitter? Uh, well, partially, yeah. Okay. Um, and also because uh, ESPN sort of promoted this, okay? Um, when I, like I said, I was in Milwaukee when, when Michael Jackson died. Yeah. But prior to that, before I was told about this, um, my friend Ben, who, uh, who like, works for CBS Sports, he said that apparently Dunleavy has uh, said that Simmons has no credibility and he's a joke writer. And yes. Simmons has, been, has responded with like kind of 17 vitriolic responses. Okay. Yes, also true. Okay, now, why did you do that? I will explain it very succinctly. I'm a season ticket holder. I took it personally. I don't, I don't care if he doesn't, whatever, he doesn't care about the career, but I had to pay to watch his crap team, not only the last two years, but really the last six, except for one good season, and he shouldn't be coming back as the coach. I don't feel like he should be saying anything about anybody. So well, but, just but, okay, but here's the thing, Bill. You've yeah. been hammering him for two years. A guy right. on the radio asks him to sort of address these criticisms. What's he supposed to say? I agree with him? I'm a bad coach? I know. I mean, I was surprised that you reacted as much as you did. It drives me crazy that he's the coach. I, I, I will fully admit that I'm not totally rational about it because the players don't like him and the fans don't like him and they won't fire him because they're too cheap. Well, and okay, he, here, he okay, walks around now, like he's doing a good job. Okay, you're getting, you're getting into tricky ground here, though, William. Yes. Because, why? well, okay, you, then you were interviewed by uh, the cow herd, uh, what's his name? Uh, Colin Cow. Yeah, Colin Cow. Okay. And, yes. um, and you were saying, like, you know, uh, he, he, the players hate, you know, hate him or whatever. And he said, how do you know this? And you said, well, I know things. Okay. Right. But now you're in a position where you're not really a fan. You've got 200,000 people who are ever following you on Twitter. You Good are point. sort of working as a journalist. You're definitely still an extension of who you are in the media on Twitter. Well, let's figure that out. Do you think Twitter is real journalism? <sighs> is it real journalism? Well, I mean, it's. It's real media. I don't know if it's necessarily real journalism, but it's definitely media. Because other reporters, not just in basketball but in other sports, have passed along rumors in 140-character tweets mm -hmm. that, you know, they're not saying where they got it from. They're just saying, hey, I heard this is, might be happening. Here, this might be coming. I agree with you. I probably shouldn't have said the Dunleavy that people don't like him, even though I've, you know, whatever. I've a lot of stories that... I'm not going to betray people's confidences, but, mm. um, and things I've witnessed in person. It just, you know, I've been going to NBA games since I was five. I can tell when a team doesn't like their coach. You can, there's a million different signs of body language and in a huddle, whether they're listening to them, whether, whether they're looking at the cheerleaders or whether they're loafing through games. Like, wouldn't you agree that there are a lot of signs that you can tell oh, when a team certainly. doesn't like their coach? I mean, that's, I, I, you know, I, and I think that, I think that, that so I was it's not, bad it's not phrasing, out of maybe. your right to make to say that, um, right. but to me it just seemed as though as much as you've written about him, and when he goes on the radio and takes a shot at you, uh, wouldn't I mean? Don't you just have to kind of go like, well, I guess that's what I expected him to do? Yeah, but why can't I play it up and have fun with it? Well, but, I mean, I was but, clearly but when I went on coward, I wasn't total. Was I? Did I sound like I was like, you know? Rip, oh, I can't say that word. Did I sound like I was ripped? Like I was just really mad at him and wanted revenge, or did I sound no, like I was no, you didn't. Fun you sounded it? you sounded kind of affable. Yeah, but what what are you playing it up for? I'm playing it up because first of all, nobody in LA cares about the Clippers, and nobody seems to care about these season ticket holders. That basically, you know, they've been going to these games since 1984. They have the worst owner in, in the league and possibly in any professional sport. The, uh, they still charge these L.A. prices because they know that people are going to keep paying them just under the hope that things might turn around. And then the one thing we all agreed on last year was that this Clippers team did not like playing for Mike Dunleavy, and they brought him back anyway because they owed him – they didn't want to eat his contract. I don't think that's right. Well, but wouldn't you – if you if you were responding, though, as – if you were just a ticket holder, wouldn't yeah. your response just be not to buy tickets? Yeah, but here's the thing. Because you're, you're, you're writing from the perspective of a fan, but you are operating from the perspective of someone with a huge audience in the media. No, I'm op in this particular case, I'm operating as a consumer because the reason I have Clipper tickets is because I go to see the other teams because I like going to see NBA games. It's impossible to get Laker tickets. 
I can have, I can go to 20 to 25 games. I can see every good guy on every other team. I can see the Celts when they come in, the Cavs, the Lakers, all these different teams. The only thing I want from the Clippers, I don't care if they win 60 games, just be competitive. I don't. I, I can't even tell you how many 30-point blowouts I went to last year. It had to have been at least 12 or 15. Yeah, but, but Dunleavy wasn't responding to you as a consumer. You weren't brought up in his original interview about the draft because you're a consumer. Yeah, how, come you're said, the only con, how come you were the only consumer whose ideas were voiced in this interview? What do you mean? Well, what, who else would have been voiced? Well, what, that's what I'm saying. It's, you're not really. Just, it, I think it's a little disingenuous to say that Why? you're operating from a, as a perspective of a consumer because what you, because you, the reason you're part of the conversation is not to do with your consumerism; it's with your media presence. So yeah, but I'm different. saying, but if somebody says that, all right, just for sake of argument, somebody says he's a joke, he has no credibility, isn't that like the ultimate pot calling the kettle black moment? Like, why couldn't I have fun with that? This guy has now, he's one of like three coaches in the, in the history of the NBA who's coming back for a seventh season with a winning percentage under, I forget the exact number. Um, who has less credibility than him? Okay, so it would be like, so if Jerry West had said this, how would you have responded? If somebody asked Jerry West about you as a columnist. I would have been bummed like, out, hey, but I, I wouldn't yeah. have fired back at Jerry West. He's Jerry West. So you would have, you would have if, if Jerry West came out and said that you're a Joe Grady with no credibility, your response would have been what? Probably nothing. Probably You would just felt bad, I guess. I, guess yeah, I, I mean, would. Doc Rivers has, has come out and said stuff, and I haven't challenged him on it. It's really specifically just Dunleavy and the fact that you know, he is just so pompous, and that team has been so bad, and he makes so many different excuses about it. This is the only coach GM in the league. No other person in the league has both titles, and they've won 42 games the last two years. Don't you think he'd be a little humble at this point? Don't you think he'd be like, you know, I'm not a fan of Bill's column, but at the same time, we certainly haven't had a lot of success the last couple of years. He's a season ticket holder. He's got a right to his opinion. Like, that seems to me that would be the answer. So you feel that? Well, that's interesting. I guess that that uh, I mean, because when when you you were, you have attacked him pretty aggressively, and you yeah, kind of all above the belt though. Well, I mean, you, you don't think he his, deserved it though? Well, you make fun of his clothes. You make fun of that he squints too much. I called him squinty. I mean, well, how, that's that. Why now? That's that's not really a basketball related criticism. No, probably not. Do you think it's a cheap shot though? Yeah. Really? You think Squinty is a cheap shot? Well, it's not. It's not. It's not a vicious attack. But when he, if he is questioning that your integrity and saying that you're a joke writer, and then your response is that he squints too much. What about when I said that he looked like Ed Lauder? I, I would. I would guess that would be sort of in the same uh, in the same box, right? You know, they, that's neither a compliment nor an insult because he does look like Ed Lauder. <laughs> it's a statement of fact. <laughs> <laughs> he really. It's creepy how much he looks like Ed Lauder. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I've taken any personal shots at him. You know, I, I've certainly had some interactions with him that let a, left a little to be desired, like the time that he welched on a shooting bet that I was doing for the C60 piece, and Elja Baylor went crazy about it. I think I wrote about that once. I don't think since I wrote about that story, I don't think he's like me. Well, okay, but. you know what? I, I, I've, I've sort of been fascinated with all of this by kind of, like, I'm not on Twitter, but I follow your Twitter feed. Well, explain why you're not on Twitter. Because I try to get you to do it, and you're just totally against it. Well, I, I, I mean, a bunch of reasons. For one, I mean, I, I feel like, okay, now I have a book coming out in October that will be what, six books in eight years or whatever. I feel like there's enough of my content in the world. If people are interested in what I'm thinking about or, or what I'm sort of engaged with, there's tons of that content out there. Um, I don't necessarily want to feel as though my entire life is just something that exists in order to sort of feed a persona. I, you yeah, know? But, and I feel other people write about me enough. Why do I need to write about myself if other people are going to do it? I don't, you know, um, I, I don't know. Say, why does it have to be everything or nothing? Why can't it just be something where you pass along your thoughts as you're watching World Cup that you might not ever pass along like I did yesterday? Oh yeah, you know, cause I, okay, like yesterday when the World Cup was, or when the, when the soccer was on, it did occur to me when, uh, like, I started watching at like the 64th minute or something. Right. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, the U.S. was still ahead, and I remember thinking, considering how sort of insufferable and elitist American soccer fans are when our team is awful, what is it going to be like if we become a world power? 
See, I would have wanted to know that. It's going to be like the Yankees times a thousand. <laughs> well, but but I mean, I I just thought that. I mean, I don't I don't. What's the value? I mean, I guess the value on Twitter would be what it is. Nothing. I mean, it's just what someone thinks. But I mean, do you you had all. I totally Twitter. disagree. I think you're wrong, because first of all, you're saying you're above the people that read you, and that they can read you at, at your convenience when you're ready to have something for them to read. How would it be different on Twitter? Because on Twitter, they're reading can, at their convenience. All right, let's say you're one of the most well-read people I know. What Name two great magazine things that you've read in the last couple weeks. I read Malcolm Gladwell's review of uh, Chris Anderson's book this morning. Okay, and you liked it? Um, I generally agreed with it, not all of it, but most of it. Did you think it was worth my time reading it? Uh, Sure, I don't know. I mean, you're saying that I should do it in order to convince people to read things that I'm reading or I don't No, I'm saying that you could use it kind of like I do as a tool to to pass along stuff to readers to react to stuff that wouldn't be worthy of actually, you know, a whole essay or a book chapter or whatever. But like for instance, today the MLB or or Fox announced that they're going to take Twitter questions during all, during the All-Star game. So I posted a Twitter set, a Twitter question, why do you guys continue to have this embargo on Saturday? On Saturdays, where I can't watch my team, even though I'm paying for the extra innings package, because I, I've been joking about that on Twitter over and over again. I pay for this extra innings package, and I'm not allowed to watch the Red Sox on Saturday because Fox has a whole embargo on Saturday afternoons, basically. Mm-hmm. Now that's something. Here, I passed on the Twitter thing. Now other people can can Twitter Fox whatever questions they want and have some fun with it. Well, yeah, I'm certainly not telling you not to be on Twitter. I know you're not. I'm, and, convi- and, and, I'm trying to convince you to go on Twitter because I think you'd be funny. And I think you'd have you'd read things that maybe I wouldn't know about. Or you'd pass along some weird clip that your buddy sent you that you're like, wow, maybe a lot of people haven't seen this and they would be interested by this. I don't know. You know, it's, it's a You just little, don't want to be a part of our lives is what you're saying. Well, I... I, I a part of whose lives? I mean, you have like 200 and some thousand people who follow yeah, you. Yeah, but now. Ashton okay. Kutcher has 3 million. I mean, well, okay. those in numbers both, don't mean anything. In both cases, it, I just think that, uh, um, like, in some ways, you feel, I don't, I feel, okay, here's, here's maybe a way I can describe this. Okay. I feel like, when do uh, people, artists of any kind, writers, musicians, filmmakers, when do they start getting in trouble? I feel like they start getting in trouble when they try to extend their quote-unquote brand yeah. farther than what their actual audience is. Right. And they start saying that they start, they start trying to appeal to people who aren't really the kind of people who's supposed to be reading or watching or experiencing what they do anyways. You know? I mean, I, I don't... Uh, so you're saying I mean, that people you, on Twitter are beneath you. How, is it, how are they beneath <laughs> no, you? I'm kidding. No. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, you know... Uh, you sort of know you've expanded sort of base of followers, you know. <laughs> you always you always have to turn things back to my career. <laughs> well, I think I'm the whatever only podcast person. we're doing, we we turn it back. I'll tell you why I'm doing it. I just I've only been doing it for two months, and I just think it's fun. It's a different format, and it actually like helps me in terms of writing one liners. It's actually good practice. So some of them work, some of them don't. But it's so kind of workshopping material, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of got me in the habit of instead of writing notes down in a journal or whatever, like when I have a thought or something that I want to use, I mean, and I'm sure like three months from now or six months from now, I'll probably be down to like one Twitter post a day. But right now I'm having fun with it and I, I enjoy trying to craft the, the 140 character posts. Like I just have fun with it. So there's things that you're probably right. I'm probably wrong about this. I mean, you're involved in something I'm not involved in, so maybe you're a, a more authoritative person to comment on. But there are things that worry me about it. I've seen this. I don't happen. blame you. I mean, I've seen this happen with like with talk radio, certainly with basically all the major blogs, um, and to a degree now with Twitter. Where what happens is that uh, people start. It's it's almost impossible, sort of, not to become infatuated or at least a little bit interested in people responding to you directly. And what I fear that often happens, and I've, I had this same fear, I kind of had this fear when you do all those mailbags, you start to think are interesting, and sort of the tacks you take tend to reflect what you're getting back from the audience. But it's only a thin slice of that audience. It's only this certain kind of person who actively wants to be involved with what they read in this really kind of real, 
kind of a, a, a tangible, sort of self-gratifying way. You're talking and, about the loud minority. Well, yeah, we just, you know, like, okay, take any of the big sports blocks. That they, yeah. they all were better when they started than when they began to attract the commentating culture. Because what inevitably happened is they saw what kinds of posts get the biggest response from commentators, and those become the most read pieces. And right. then they all shift toward the kind of the select topics and ideas that generate that kind of response. I do think that there's something very detrimental about trying to be a creative person and constantly interfacing with the audience you're creating for. But who said you had to interface with the Twitter audience? But you are. Because if, if I put Sports Guy 33 into the Twitter search field, I see a whole level of people who are writing directly at you. And I don't believe you're not reading them. Yeah, but I also, the emails that people send in through the ESPN thing, I, I think those are more interesting than but the 140 same thing, character though. Twitter things. It's the same thing, though. I mean, I, you know, you, yeah, like, you're, you're for, a big fan of the mailbag. You like, you like those, right? That's kind of one of your, I think I've seen you say those are your favorite. I love those. Right? But here's the difference, though, with the people that, the people that usually write in, and that one of the reasons I think the mailbag still works is because it's a whole wide range of people. Like, I get emails from people in law firms and people in college, people in high school, people, people who are supposedly at work at real businesses. I don't think it's a typical intersection that you might normally see. I know, but it's impacting the way you write. So but I, think I, there, I haven't done a mailbag certain, in three months, though. But I, this is, I'm saying this over time, that there are yeah. certain subjects that people consistently ask you about and want to know about, and I think that has become uh, more intertwined with the things you write all the time. Yeah, but couldn't I we say that about you, like though? Teen Wolf, for example. I yeah, feel but like that's just because it's been Teen on. Wolf, and then all these other people will, will write to you anytime that they see like some kind of Teen Wolf moment, and now it seems less organic to me. That I would not... flip that around, though, because Teen Wolf's been on all the time. Well, I mean, people end up writing about whatever movie is being shown constantly. Like, if, t if something's in the oh, TNT so loop. So you're saying that, that the amount that you get emailed about Teen Wolf is only reflective of how much Teen Wolf is shown. Actually, I would say, yeah, because, and here's why. Because I don't think I've written anything about Vision Quest the last couple of weeks. Uh -huh. Maybe I might have done one in passing thing, but I'm getting a ton of emails about Vision Quest lately because it's been on all the time. People email me about what's on. I don't think they email about what they think, you know, because I wrote something and now they're trying to pile on. They, usually the emails that I get are stuff like, I was watching Castaway last night. Did you ever notice? Like, if I'm getting a TV email, it's usually something like that. Well, but when you go and look at the people who were responding to you on Twitter during the NBA playoffs, there was an endless number of, of writers who was contacting you talking about refereeing, okay? Because this is one of the things that, that's like a really hot-button issue with you and that you consistently talk about. So and you're saying people feed my need to talk about officiating? No, I don't, feel they, I don't think they feed your need to it, but I think that it validates in your mind that these are things that people respond to, and unconsciously... <laughs> How do you always try to turn these podcasts around on me? Well, Why don't I, we talk about you? I mean, let's say you go to book signings. You don't, okay. You're telling me people don't bring up the same kind of topics. Oh, they to totally do. They totally do, and I'm... I'm hyper conscious of it now because I realize that, you know, uh, how does someone become a caricature of what they do? It's when right. they start to lose the sense that the things that they're creating um, are coming from inside of them as opposed to from outside sources. Yeah, but yeah. I still feel like everything I'm writing is coming from it's stuff that I notice and things that I watch and things that I care about, like with the officiating. That's something that I've been writing about for 10 years, and I still think they're doing a terrible job with it, and they don't care about that the system's broken. They don't care that these they're trotting out referees who are in their 60s. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I just you, think I think it's a I real agree problem. With you. I think I wrote you an email about one of your columns about this that I thought was particularly good, in fact, didn't I? Yeah, you like the ref yeah. column. But, I mean, what I could have done, in which I didn't, was obviously I'm not going to pile on that column by running a whole Microsoft Word document of, people who agree that, yes, the NBA officials is a problem. I think I kind of go in and out of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I said my piece. The officiating is a problem. I, I, that was the only column I wrote about it, and that was it. You know, I think, like, something like uh, the Kobe, you know, the Kobe column I wrote, I think that's an example of, of kind of not conforming because the consensus at the time was that Kobe – had done his thing, and now he believed in his teammates and all that stuff, and I just didn't feel like that was true.
And even though even a lot of the emails I was getting was from Laker fans saying, "See, Kobe showed you." You know, I I don't know. I don't I don't feel like I conform to the emails. I don't what? think conform conform makes it sound like you're a puppet or something. What I'm saying though is it's hard. Isn't it difficult not to be affected? by people reading your work and then telling you what they think of it and what they like about it. Even if, you know, I, I don't know how you can possibly uh, uh, suspect that that doesn't affect your psyche. I would say it doesn't because I've been getting emails for 12 years. I mean, if anything, the emails bounce off me. You should see some of the bad ones. Well, and, I, and a lot of, you know, sometimes I get help with reading them too, but I, I just think... I, as you said before, people who are going to email, you have to realize that sometimes you're going to get thoughtful emails and sometimes you're going to get emails from people who are in that loud minority sector. And you just got to decide what's what input is worth it and what's not. How? Um, but what does this have to do with Twitter? Oh, you're, th you're well, saying that I, I'm I reacting to the Twitter things. But a lot of – most of the time I don't even read those Twitter. You know, I might go in to try – I delve in to try to retweet stuff every once in a while, but most of the stuff I don't see. And I don't know if a lot of people, if some people are different in that well, respect, I, I never, they're playing I never, off the people. I never understand this. Like when they when they say like they go at Sports Guy Thirty Three or whatever, yeah. um, does that come up in a like do you do you, do these all come to your? I don't, I don't I don't even know. Is there an inbox for things that are directed toward you or something? Or? No, you can click on like a replies link, and then you see all the people who reply to it. Yeah, and you could just, but it's really hard to read because the way they set it up, it only shows like ten or twelve at a time, which is why. If you don't look, you just it's impossible to catch up. So I'll look at it, like just because I don't know that much about soccer, and I was interested in some of the different people's takes. Sorry to cut away. That wraps up part one of the Chuck Klosterman podcast. Please go back to ESPN.com or iTunes to grab part two with Chuck Klosterman here on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. Until then. <laughs> Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. That concludes, ends, finishes, wraps up another BS Report. With all the talk about baseball, the upcoming football season, and hockey playoffs, Bill Simmons neglected to mention something which, frankly, cannot go unstated. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> For a limited time, hurry into Subway and enjoy the new Tuscan chicken melt. Lovely seasoned chicken, melted bubbly cheese with olive vinaigrette. Piled so high with the crisp veggies you love on your choice of freshly baked bread. All that deliciousness with 9 grams of fat. It's part of a fresh fit meal.